Hey everyone. So um, what I wanted to talk, talk to you about first of all is just to explain what is the difference between running a geospatial workload on the cloud as opposed to on-premises or, or any other type of infrastructure. Because you're probably already aware that if you, if you were running a workload on, on, a, on any cloud, you could stand up a bunch of virtual machines and um, uh, provision a bunch of block storage and everything would look exactly the same as any other environment. But there's one thing I'd like to, um, one picture I'd like you to, to take away with you when you leave here. And that's that the, um, the, the cloud gives you the option of flipping that whole infrastructure on its head. So instead of actually bringing the data to the compute infrastructure, you basically bring the compute infrastructure to the data. And um, in, the, in the AWS environment, that, that, um, that data is represented using S3 object stores. And the concept there is that S3 is a, is a highly durable, highly scalable object storage layer that pretty much any AWS service will be able, uh, can integrate with natively. And so I've got Amazon Athena there. You can run SQL queries directly against um, uh, CSV files or JSON files or Parquet files sitting on S3. You don't need to load them into a database. You can run uh, Spark, Apache Spark jobs on them. You can do MapReduce type tasks on, on, um, on S3 directly without moving it from S3 into a Hadoop file system. You can have Amazon EC2 instances directly re uh, referencing the S3 data. And I'll show you uh, an example a little bit later where we've got a, um, a bunch of data, the NREL organization running HD, HD5 data sitting, sorry, HDFF5 sitting on S3 and directly accessing it through EC2 instances, again, without moving it to block storage. So that's probably the key difference is because you're basically bringing the compute to the storage, it takes a lot of the, the, uh, the, the plumbing and a lot of the um, uh, hassle out of dealing with data. So the, the, the key phrase there is share, don't copy. By sharing the data, by publishing the data once from the producers and actually consuming it n number of times globally across your choice of infrastructure, whether it's workspaces for running, say, a, a, a heavy duty visualization software stack that needs multiple GPUs and 4K monitors and uh, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, you can run that on a virtual desktop. You can do EC2 instances, MapReduce, as I mentioned. You can do serverless compute with Lambda, where you actually don't actually stand up servers at all. You write a piece of Python code, you put in pandas or your choice of geospatial libraries and directly reference the S3 data. Or you can do machine learning training based on the S3 data as well. And we've, there's a bunch of customers um, of AWS uh, in New Zealand, in Wellington, in fact, doing a whole lot of machine learning work with large image files and large um, uh, personally identifiable information sets as well. So the reason we, um, what I want to talk about specifically though is about open data. So taking that a step further, once we're actually talking about sharing data and bringing the compute, it means it makes it very, very attractive to be able, for organizations to be able to publish their data and share it using that S3 layer. And what we've been hearing from customers like MetService and Digital Globe is it'd be really great if someone could actually take the problem of having to manage big FTP servers or file servers or web servers for distributing gigabytes or even terabytes of data a day away from us and us, have it, us having to ensure availability. And likewise, the consumers of that data are telling us that what they really want is to avoid that hassle of having to do regular downloads. When I was at MetService, that was, that was a big part of our job was actually downloading global meteorological files from ECMWF, from the UK Met Office, from GFS, from a bunch of, uh, from uh, Japanese meteorological agency, satellite data all over the infrastructure, all over the network infrastructure. That was almost like our number one headache. Um, compared to that, running the weather models is relatively simple, being a bit flippant, but it's, it's a big job. So what AWS has responded to is by saying, well, why don't, why don't you let us actually manage that storage for you? And if the data is actually genuinely useful to a large number of people, we'll take on the actual storage costs and the data access costs as well. So the only thing you need to do is basically provide, as a producer, is provide the content. So the and, and probably the biggest advantage is this, is this uh, it opens up your data as a pr producer to a larger community of users. Um, we have a saying in AWS that 99% that of the smartest people in the world do not work for AWS, they work for someone else. And that's probably true of your organizations as well, maybe not as much, but um, it, it's certainly the case that most of the brains are actually don't work for you and you can leverage that by publishing your data. And, um, and, and I'll, I'll go a little bit further than that. It's, it's actually a lot more than just dumping the data somewhere um, on S3. But uh, by publishing that data, you open it up to that community. It lowers, lowers the cost of research as well, because if you're not actually having to worry about network pipes and that sort of thing, if you're able to run 
um, Jupyter Notebooks or write, write your own Python code directly against the S3 data, um, it means you're actually running projects in a matter of minutes and you're not having to invest in infrastructure as well. So um, I'll talk to you a little bit about our, our, our public data sets that are, that are already are in our registry. Uh, these are some of the major providers of, that, of those data sets. As you imagine, NASA pu publishes a lot of satellite imagery. You can see this, the Hubble t uh, Space Telescope data there if you're interested in it as well. Uh, but there's, there's some surprising organisations there which probably aren't geospatial in nature, but the Nat National Institutes of Health. They publish de-identified um, patient records um, into this repository as well. There's financial data, there's um, a, a stack of meteorological data sources raising from, ranging from radar, satellite imagery, global weather models, um, uh, uh, local area models like WARF and that sort of thing. Now, in terms of actually how you go about finding it, we've got a, um, if, if you go to the AWS, there's a URL there, open data AWS, you'll see there's a registry and you can basically just put in a search and that will give you um, all the, all the information, a link to the, uh, to the data set and it'll have a full page about what's actually, just back up, a full page about how to access that data and it's usually just a URL. But more importantly, there's, um, there's robust documentation that sits behind it. Um, there's, there's tutorials, there's Jupyter Notebooks, there's, there's GitHub links where you can actually uh, access some tools that will make it easy to consume the data as well. So in terms of how to share data, um, one of the things we've learned through this open data program is that there's some really, it's, it's more than just dropping the data somewhere and, and saying, go for your lives and make use of this. There's a few things you need to do. The first thing is, is non-technical considerations associated with sharing. Number one is actually trust. That if someone's gonna invest time in, um, in building a solution, a, a pipeline or a data processing pipeline against your data, they need to be able to trust your data. And that means that, that if you've got any sort of remote sensing network with actual mechanical components or cameras or whatever, those things go wrong. So when they go wrong, you need to be able to tell people that it's gone wrong so they can actually adapt to that. Landsat's a really good example of that, that, uh, that, that they actually had a, um, some sensors fail on a satellite a few years ago and they actually went bent over backwards to make sure that everyone knew about that and everyone was factoring, factoring in those um, those sensor failures into their software stacks. We used to have that with MET service as well with some of the polar orbiters that they would, over time they would break down, sensors would get irradiated and they would stop working or lose sensitivity. And they, and, and, and as a provider, um, they were obliged to, they told us that and we were able to incorporate that. So that really builds trust. Second thing is actually exactly the same as software. You need good documentation. You need use cases, you need tutorials, you need sample code that people can actually get started with. And lastly, accessibility. Again, if people are gonna put a lot of effort into tooling, they wanna know they can get that data when they need it, if, particularly if they're doing operational processing. Some of these meteorological agencies are publishing um, hourly observations on this, on this repository. It's not just static data, it's actually live data. Some, some data sets are being updated every minute. So if, if you've got consumers, or if you are a consumer and you're consuming that data, you wanna know that that data's always there and you can get to it. And it's not gonna grind to a halt when lots of people are downloading it. So just that little curve there, it means that what that's suggesting is that as the trustworthiness, level of documentation, and accessibility of your data resource improves, your user base basically starts, um, starts to grow um, pretty, pretty steeply. If, if the data is really useful, people will persist and they'll, they'll, they'll get onto it and they'll figure it out somehow. But if you really want to access a large user base and people, particularly pick, um, busy people, you need to invest a bit of time. The second thing is technical considerations. And this is a little bit, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but you can overthink um, and as well as underthink your, uh, your data representation formats. Underthinking is pretty obvious. It's when you just take a binary data, da database dump or something like that, drop it onto S3 and say, go for your lives. That's no good to anyone. Some people access it, but it's gonna be very, um, uh, very difficult for them. You can also overthink it. If you design a handcraft, a really fine tuned API for a specific use case, you might think you're doing people a favor and, and for some of the user base you are, but you're also gonna alienate um, some, some people that actually sit in the middle that um, need something a little bit more flexible than uh, originally defined API, but don't wanna go and read binary database dumps. So, so ideally what you're doing is actually trying to cater for multiple use cases. By all means, build your API, but also make the data available in a more raw format so that people can, act, can actually download it and do their own manipulations and slice it and dice it in the ways they make, make sense for them. So some common use cases, you can, um, 
also optimize your data for some common use cases. I'll show you an example with uh, wind farm mo modeling uh, in a couple of minutes where um, the provider's actually gone through a techno-economic analysis of the weather data. So they, take, they converted wind speeds into actual shaft power outputs for the turbines. So you can make an, so, um, uh, wind, uh, local agencies or power authorities could make decisions about how useful it would be to put aside a, a wind turbine in that location. So moving from the meteorological domain to the um, economic domain. Build a map and an index. Don't just drop it into a, th into, don't just have a directory and, and trust that people will understand when you file naming conventions. Build a searchable index. Um, provide a cherry picking mechanism. So if you've built an index and, you're, and people are able to target a slice of data or build a query that, that can select a subset, build a mechanism by which they can extract that data using range type selections. Because they'll, they'll save them a lot of time and it'll save them a lot of um, uh, download time as well. And lastly, track usage. Um, measure how, how people are using your data. So I'll just finish up with a couple of examples. So one of them is um, on in our common, common data repository. Uh, one of them is th called the uh, Blue Dot Observatory. And what that is, is a, um, it's a consortium that's, um, that's, that's uh, set up to analyze the Sentinel-2 uh, satellite observation data. And their objective is actually to look at um, water, uh, patterns of water consumption and, uh, and actually the depletion of water resources in, throughout the world, particularly in the developing world. And there's a pretty scary map showing, um, that, could be, <laughs> that could be Sydney, if anyone's from Sydney, that could be uh, Western Sydney, um, by all means, with the, the, the reservoirs. But you can see there, um, over, over a space of time, um, how, how those uh, water resources are drying up. One of the things that the uh, Blue Dot Observatory told us is that with this model of, of actually accessing the data in, on the open, common data repository, is they can process a month of data consisting of 7,000 7, bodies for only six euros. So it can be super cheap to do some serious science on, this, on these data sets. Um, another example, LIDAR data. Uh, so this is a US Geological Services has published a LIDAR da um, a point cloud consisting of 10 trillion points. Um, as you might expect, it's over the US. But um, potentially it's actually got the ability for, to do every, to um, provide mechanisms for flood researchers, for agricultural researchers to do some serious science on very high resolution uh, elevation data. So that's available on the Open Data Repository as well. Um, and one I'll just drill down into a little bit is called the NREL or the National Research uh, Re Renewable Energy Laboratories, the Wind Integration National Data Set. Now what, they, what uh, NREL have done is they've done a, um, produced a weather model which, uh, which has been corrected using observations, um, surface, surface observations, scatterometer observations from satellites, and they produced a two kilometre resolution grid of the US um, and uh, with five minute temporal resolution spanning is that seven years at, at all the elevations, all the vertical elevations that are meaningful to commercial wind farm operators. That's um, 500 petabytes of HDF5 um, data. So it's a re reasonably chunky um, set of data. Um, now what, what's actually built up, and that's published on the Open Data Repository. But, and you can download that. If, you're, if you've got a good pipe, you can download that. But um, what, what most organisations are doing, or what most consumers of this data, data, which are basically people that want to run wind farms, are doing is actually using a thing called the Wind Toolkit. And that's an open source set of tools that have basically been developed to specifically consume this data, as well as reusing some other HDF5 um, formats. So uh, there's a couple of components there. There's Pi WTK that provides an API for accessing the, uh, the HDF5 uh, data. Uh, and, the, and it's designed to be, um, to be able to work in like a download mode where you actually download these files, or it can work in a native mode where you run it against, um, load it up as Lambda functions in AWS and directly query the, the S3 data. Um, we see more and more of this is where open source projects will have an option to basically process data um, using cloud native services as well as downloading type services. There's a tool called WinViz which sits on top of Pi WTK that, um, uh, as, uh, and another service I'll mention in a moment called HSDS. And that image there, which should be moving, but it's, um, there's no, uh, no, no player on this, on this machine, um, would, show, would show the wind barbs moving through time um, on that map. And that, that's, a, that's a, a visualization tool where you can zoom in on particular wind farm sites, different elevations, and, and work out um, what, the, what the economic suitability of that site might be.
Uh, there's another library which isn't actually specific to NREL, but if you've got HDF, HDF5 data, which there's an awful lot of that, there's, it's the dominant format in, in meteorology, it's used by a lot of satellite formats, so I imagine you've come across that as NetCDF or NetCDF4, that sort of thing. It's basically a, a, a data format that's optimised for um, uh, large-scale compute jobs. It more or less presents a database or a, um, a multi-dimensional data grid as a uh, represented a single file to a piece of code. So it can it can basically just do array processing, dimensional array processing directly on the file. Um, so it's uh, there's a library called H5PYD that's uh, been designed to sit on top of. Um, a, uh, been designed to actually optimise the access to these big data sets. And the way it does that, and I'll just show you a little diagram here, is that it can directly query the S3 objects. So you've got HDF5 data sitting in, in S3 um, as individual, probably multi-gigabyte files. And then it goes through a, um, a, does parallel queries against that data. And there's a little, a little graphic there showing how that, how that works. It basically chunks up the data sets, works out which blocks or which files or partitions in the data set it needs to retrieve, goes out and gets them all in parallel to S3, and then brings back the data set and presents it to the overlying application. So th the benefit of that is that you can do potentially, um, uh, these things can scale to, th this uh, uh, library can scale to uh, hundreds of nodes if need be, working in parallel against S3. So they can very quickly process, um, allow algorithms to run directly against HDF5 data even though the data is just sitting in place on S3, no downloads required. So if um, I've just, uh, there's a couple of use cases I've covered now. There's, uh, the, we've got a guide here, there's a URL, uh, which has also got um, a lot of the guidance about sharing and consuming data that I've mentioned. There's some additional use cases, Transport for London, um, the African Regional Data Cube, uh, NOAA's NextRad, uh, um, NextRad uh, repository, which is their um, composite radar, um, Doppler radar for the whole continental US, I wish we had it here, and, um, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's shareable on the repository as well. So have a look at that guide, it's, really, it's a really useful resource. And lastly, this is, this is usually the first slide in the, in the deck, but um, I hate leading with all sorts of cloudy economic type stuff, but aside from um, what we've been talking about with cloud infrastructure, one thing to bear in mind is that the some of the other key differences, and this applies to any cloud, not just AWS, is that it, it avoids that no, no upfront expense. You pay for what you use. Um, most of these science projects I've been talking about have cost literally um, 10, 15 cents, in some cases a, a couple of dollars to, to stand up and get running, and they can be provisioned in minutes. So you only pay for what you use. Improves your market agility because you don't need to provision resources, sign contracts, you can scale up or down, and the whole thing's self-service. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Uh, really good talk. Um, so the uh, the nearest AWS region to here is Sydney, right? Yep. So that's another win for Australia, right? <laughs> Sucked in New Zealand. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how many New Zealand organisations are part of the public data set program? How many? Yeah, how many how many organisations are actually have a um, a bucket sharing um, data? Probably Doc would probably be the most would be the most um, uh, pro proficient uh, proficient in that area. Doc, uh, Doc, Department of Conservation. Okay, they, they've right. got ecological data sets that they uh, that they are well, going through the onboarding process for this. Met Service has some. We're talking to Met Service about data as well. Yep. But Doc have also got a bunch of APIs for doing things like um, national uh, yep. sites and national. And are they part of the public data set program? No, they're actually they're actually conventional APIs. Yep. That, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Exciting. Questions from the audience. Matt, hold on. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of those examples that you used for, were from uh, North America. Um, what, what do you see as the biggest roadblock um, in this particular region, so Australia, New Zealand, Boy, that's Pacific a political question. Islands? <laughs> um, uh, it, it seems like different governments uh, are deploying point solutions by different vendors. Like, how do we bring this all together? Well. Uh, and to, to answer your first question, the, the, the answer is, to be honest, it's funding. That, the, uh, that those US organisations, the reason they do this is because they're funded to do this. 
that they're funded to, the, the NOAA, for example, is funded to actually publish their weather models um, to the world. They've got a mandate to publish it to the world. Um, same with the Japanese Meteorological, Meteorological Organisation. They've got a mandate to do this. So this just provides them with a, a channel to access the data. Um, New Zealand, um, for various reasons and the way the, way the organisations, most of the uh, scientific organisations have been uh, set up in New Zealand, they don't really have access to those sorts of funding resources and they've had to rely on commercialisation of a lot of their data. So we're getting there as we're talking to them all the time about so let's, let's see what we can actually share, but it's a, it's a long journey at the moment. Um, the other, your other question about, um, about uh, fragmentation, it, it's, um, the, exa the example I've shown are, are US based, but there's a lot of European meteorological organizations, meteorological organizations, ESA, for example, the European Space Agency, um, they've been very prolific with the use of this repository as well. Um, and actually, the, uh, some of the Australian agencies are in the process of sharing, sharing data through this repository as well. So there's nothing, for, we've actually got um, quite a few agencies talking to this, to our open data program at the moment uh, to try and get their data sets on board. Any other questions? I have heard that an agency, uh, Geoscience Australia, may share some data through a cloud provider. Yep. Um, is that it? Cool. All right. Thank you very much. No worries.